Hi everybody. In this lecture, we're going to talk about free energy as a force towards equilibrium. And this is for Physics 3230, Thermal Physics. The textbook is Schroeder's Thermal Physics. But I think maybe a better title for this lecture might be More Reasons Why Entropy is the Most Fundamental Idea in the Universe and Everything Else Just Comes Second. <laughs> All right. Now, in previous lectures, um, we've been discussing systems as if they were isolated, not in contact with the universe or reservoir or their surroundings. And we know that for isolated systems, uh, a system's entropy wants to increase, right? But if a system isn't isolated, but is instead in good contact with its environment, then the entropy of the universe will increase, even if it's um, the case that that means that the system's entropy decreases, right? So, in other words, the total entropy for the universe is going to want to increase, and that's the second law of thermodynamics. All right, so let's assume that our system here is in contact with a reservoir. So the total entropy would then be the entropy of the system, S cis, plus the entropy of the reservoir, S res. Okay, so that's here in this line. Now, if we allow those things to vary, if we take it through some kind of process, then the change in the entropy, ds total, that's the total change in entropy, ds total, will be equal to ds cis plus ds reservoir. In other words, it will be the sum of the little microscopic changes of the entropy of the system and the entropy of the reservoir when taken in small steps like that. Now we're going to use the thermodynamic identity. I told you it was an important equation, and here it comes back again. So usually we uh, think of the thermodynamic identity in terms of du, um, but in this case, what we're interested in is ds, the change in entropy. So we're going to rearrange the order of our thermodynamic identity to read ds is 1 over t times du plus pdv minus, minus mu dn. All right? Now, in this case, let's let the volume and the number of particles be constant for the system and the reservoir. All right? Now, we're going to assume that the system and the reservoir are in thermal equilibrium. So that means that the reservoir and the uh, system have the same temperature, and we're just going to set both of those equal to T. Now, if V and N are constant, then that means that dS is equal to 1 over T times du. So now we're going to plug in for that for the reservoir, all right? So remember that dS total is equal to dS cis plus dS res. We're going to plug in for dS res as 1 over T times du res using the um, thermodynamic identity. Now, if the reservoir gains energy, then that means that the system loses it, right? Because they're in thermal equilibrium. They're, they're in thermal contact there. So du cis is equal to minus du res. So that means that ds total could be written as ds cis minus 1 over t du cis. So in other words, now we have the total change in entropy ds total there. We have that only in terms of things for the system. The change in entropy of the system, ds cis, minus the change in um, internal energy of the system, du cis, divided by t. Okay, so copying that over to uh, this slide, ds total is equal to ds cis minus 1 over t times du cis. So that means that if we factor it out of both cases, right, if we write ds in terms of du for both of them, right, then we can uh, factor it out and have it be negative 1 over t times du cis minus tds cis. And that is our definition of the Helmholtz free energy change, df. df was du, sorry, there's a typo there, du minus tds, okay? So we can plug in here for that, and that is the change in the Helmholtz free energy df cis of the system. So ds total is minus 1 over t times df cis. So what that tells us is that if there's an increase in the total entropy of the universe, right, ds total is positive, in other words, then that's the same as a decrease in the Helmholtz free energy of a system. So that means that a system is going to do whatever it can to minimize its Helmholtz free energy. But the reason for that is fundamentally the second law of thermodynamics, that the entropy of the universe wants to increase. And the entropy of the universe increasing means that the Helmholtz free energy of the system will be driven to a minimum. Okay? 
All right, so that's the Helmholtz one. Now let's talk about the Gibbs. Okay, what happens with the Gibbs? So in this case, we're still going to have our, our system and our reservoir and the total entropy of the universe. But now, instead of holding the volume constant, we're going to let that volume vary. And we're going to hold the pressure and the number of particles constant instead. Okay? Because remember, we usually think about things in terms of either constant volume or constant pressure processes. So now let's talk about constant pressure processes holding the number of particles constant. Okay? So, then that means that we can write our thermodynamic identity ds equal to 1 over t du plus pdv minus mu dn. dn is going to go to 0, and so that leaves us with 1 over t times du plus pdv. Now, if the system and its reservoir are in mechanical and thermal equilibrium, not just thermal equilibrium now, but mechanical and thermal equilibrium, then that means that the pressures and temperatures are the same for both system and reservoir, okay? So ds total is going to be ds cis plus, right? And now we're going to plug in for our thermodynamic identity for ds for the reservoir, and that's going to be times, or plus 1 over t times du of the reservoir plus pdv of the reservoir, okay? Now we're just saying that the temperature and the pressure are going to be the same for the system and the reservoir because they're in mechanical and thermal equilibrium. So I'm not labeling these t of the system or t of the reservoir or p of the system, p of the reservoir, because they're the same. Okay, I just call them P and T. All right, now, again, we're going to assume that if one of the two loses something, the other gains it. So if the system loses energy, the reservoir gains it, vice versa. If the system loses volume, the reservoir gains it, and vice versa. So that means that we can write du cis is equal to minus du reservoir, and also dv of the cis, the change in volume of the cis, system is going to be equal to negative dv reservoir. Okay, so what I can do is plug in then um, for the du for the reservoir and dv for the reservoir and say that those are minus the change for the system. So that means that I can write ds total is equal to negative 1 over t times du cis plus pdv cis minus tds of the system. Okay, all right, so... We're going to remember now our definition of the Gibbs, right? So remember that we have our thermodynamic identity for the Gibbs, and that's dg is equal to du plus pdv minus tds. And that's exactly what we've got here in our parenthesis. So that means that we can plug in for the Gibbs free energy change of the system into that parenthesis. So we have ds total is equal to negative 1 over t times dg of the system. So yet again, what we're seeing here is that the entropy of the universe, ds total, is going to want to increase, right? That's going to want to increase via the second law of thermodynamics. And as a result, that means that the Gibbs free energy is going to minimize. So the punchline for all of this is that maximizing the universe's entropy means decreasing the Gibbs free energy of the system, or the Helmholtz free energy of the system, depending on what you're holding constant for that problem, okay, for that situation. The entropy of the universe for it will want to increase for systems in contact with the reservoir, and that means that the Helmholtz free energy of the system for systems with constant temperature and volume, or the Gibbs free energy of the system for systems with constant temperature and pressure will want to decrease. So you often hear about how the energy of a system wants to decrease, and that's held up in um, introductory physics courses as the fundamental thing. The energy decreases, the energy decreases, the energy wants to get into the lowest energy state. But why? The reason for that is that it maximizes the entropy of the universe, which is really the driving force. So that's why I said that we should subtitle this lecture as more reasons why entropy is the most fundamental idea. Okay, that's it. That's our punchline. Now there's one other thing that I wanted to emphasize. I wasn't sure I had emphasized it enough in previous lectures. In our discussion of the Gibbs free energy and chemical potential, remember we had our thermodynamic identity for the Gibbs. dg was minus sdt plus vdp plus mu dn. Now, if you hold the temperature and pressure constant, then the partial of G with respect to N holding T and P constant is mu. So this is a really nice definition for 
the chemical potential, okay? So here, the chemical potential is the Gibbs free energy per particle, okay? So the chemical potential is the Gibbs free energy per particle, all right? Okay, so this talks about extensive and intensive quantities. So what does that all mean? And what are extensive and intensive quantities? Let's go over that. Extensive quantities are quantities that double if you double the amount of material, okay? So for example, if you have an internal energy, which would be the number of degrees of freedom F, F over two times NKT, where N is the number of particles, K is Boltzmann's constant, and T is the temperature then what you can see is that if n doubles, if the number of particles doubles, then the internal energy of the system also doubles. So that's extensive. Quantities that double if you double the amount of material. Now, entropy is also extensive. All the expressions that we've seen, really, for entropies are proportional to the number of particles, right? S is proportional to nk. So if you double the number of particles, the entropy will at least double, right? Other extensive quantities include the volume, the number of particles, of course, uh, the enthalpy, the uh, Helmholtz free energy, the Gibbs free energy, and mass, okay? Now, intensive quantities, they don't double if you double the amount of material. They remain unchanged. Some examples for that are the temperature, the pressure, the density, and the chemical potential. Now, there's always some subtext here. This is a little confusing, okay? So, for example, if N goes to 2N in a container of ideal gas, right, PV is equal to NKT, then the size of the container doesn't necessarily change. So, I was always thinking, well, doesn't that mean that P doubles too? I mean, if I double the number of particles in a container of fixed volume, then that's going to increase my pressure, right? But be aware, and here's the caveat, this definition of extensive versus intensive assumes that your container has no physical restraints, okay? So instead of thinking of an ideal gas inside of a container, maybe think of a big old chunk of silver, right? Okay, so you have a chunk of silver, and if you double the number of uh, atoms of silver that you have, then you're going to double the volume of silver that you have because silver has a fixed density, right? Solid silver sitting at room temperature and pressure has a fixed density. So that's why it's saying that intensive quantities rho is an intensive quantity because it doesn't change, for example, for a solid if you double the amount of solid that you have. You just have a bigger chunk of silver that's twice as big, okay? So that's why volume is extensive because if you double the number of atoms of silver that you have, you have twice the volume because the volume um, is uh, not constrained by a container, all right? So that's very important to make sure that you understand that caveat. Now, if you're going to manipulate extensive and intensive things, then extensive times intensive is extensive. So, for example, volume times density is mass, right? Density is intensive, volume is extensive, and then volume times density, remember the definition of density is mass divided by volume, so volume times density is mass, and that's an extensive quantity. So that's just an example for you. If you have an extensive quantity and you divide it by another extensive quantity, you get an intensive quantity. Again, I'm using picking on density a little bit here, but um, the number of particles per unit volume is the density, right? So extensive quantities are both the number of particles and the volume. You divide those two things, you get something that does not depend upon um, the, it doesn't double. So that's an intensive quantity. So N over V is intensive. And you don't do extensive times extensive, okay? That's just something that doesn't happen. If you've got extensive quantities and intensive quantities, you're only going to add like to like. So adding two quantities of the same type produces the same type. So let's look at the thermodynamic identity for the Gibbs. dg is minus sdt plus vdp plus mu dn. So what you're doing is you're multiplying extensive quantities like entropy times intensive quantities like temperature right? And that gives you another extensive quantity, G, right? DG, which is your Gibbs, okay? And you can't add intensive plus extensive, okay? So here, your volume, right? That's extensive. Your pressure is not, right? So you're multiplying extensive times intensive again, okay? Okay, so here, your last term, mu dn, right? Mu dn here, 
you've got dn, n is definitely extensive, and so mu must be intensive. So going back to the definition of g that we had before, right? Partial g with respect to n is mu. g is extensive, n is extensive. You divide those two things, you get an intensive thing. This is a chemical potential, which is a Gibbs free energy per particle, all right? Now, oftentimes, we talk about this chemical potential. Specifically, we define it in terms of the Gibbs, and the reason for that is if you go back and you look at the thermodynamic identities for the other particles, sure, sometimes, or for the other thermodynamic potentials, sure, sometimes you can take a partial and get that partial equal to mu, but you don't hold easy things constant in those cases. In some of those cases, you're holding things constant which are quite difficult to hold constant, like entropy or something crazy like that. It's really hard to hold entropy constant. So any definition uh, of mu that involves holding the entropy constant isn't very useful. So that's why the Gibbs one is the one that everybody talks about, because the Gibbs one, you're holding temperature and pressure constant, which is nice for a definition for a chemical potential. Okay, so I hope that was clear. I hope you understand extensive and intensive quantities a little bit better now. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you in class.